<coughs> Mesdames et messieurs, bonsoir. Mon nom est Gézaio, je suis de, du département de génie électrique ici à l'Université McGill. Puis je tiens à remercier François Bouffard de m'avoir invité. So my talk will deal with <coughs> sorry, electricity storage as an enabler for the integration of distributed generator generation based on renewable energy. As uh, Dr. Kirshen pointed out, one of the roles of storage is to balance uh, renewable energy. I'm going to look at the issue from the distribution network point of view. <clears throat> in other words, from the network that feeds residential, commercial, and industrial loads at typically 25 kV and below in Quebec. <clears throat> so here are some of the uh, new developments, the opportunities for storage. As I indicated, uh, renewable energy integration GHG reduction, greenhouse gas reduction, is one of the applications. The most uh, important uh, renewable energy sources in uh, the world today are solar, and in Quebec it's mostly wind. Advantages are that it's available locally. There's no fuel, no transportation cost. It's an opportunity uh, to uh, develop uh, remote areas, to create employment, etc. Storage is seen as a means of balancing, averaging renewables, variable, dealing with variable and intermittent uh, energy resources. It's seen as a way of uh, load leveling. So those are two of the issues that are tied together. I'm going to argue here that one of the better ways of integrating storage and distribution systems is by using the concept of microgrids. Microgrids as, and I'll define it in a minute, microgrids as a distribution system modernization approach because we have to modernize our grid. One of the grids that has not been touched recently is a distribution grid. There's a lot of work that has been done on the transportation grid. It's as intelligent as need be. The distribution grid is a totally different story. At the moment, it's fed from substations. There's no generation locally. It's mostly loads, and situation is changing now because we're adding renewables locally and we're adding storage. Other issues include the electrification of road transportation, notably electric and hybrid vehicles, and people are talking a lot about these as loads and generators, the famous vehicle-to-grid approach. Then there's the whole issue of remote and isolated grids where there is uh, an opportunity to integrate renewables, and there's a lot of talk, in, at least in the U.S., about net zero green communities. These are essentially communities where you do not have to supply net energy over a certain period of time, let's say a year. So this is a picture it's taken from the internet. Most of my pictures are taken from the internet. I don't acknowledge authors because I don't know them, but I apologize for having plagiarized. <clears throat> so fundamentally, a microgrid is defined as a system, a distribution system that is grid-tied, so it's fed from a substation, but it has features that allow it to produce its own generation, some of it, maybe not 100%, mostly from uh, renewables, wind, there's no, that, not that much hydro except in remote communities. Solar is a big source of energy. Then you have uh, waste is another source, biofuels. <clears throat> in most cases, particular in remote communities and in a lot of other applications, you do want to count on something that's always there that's dispatchable, you use a diesel generator or some other kind of uh, generation like combined heat and power or gas turbines. <clears throat> and then the new stuff that comes into it, which is storage. Storage in the form of capacitors, storage in the forms of electric vehicles. As I mentioned before, electric vehicles have batteries, so they can be seen as loads when you charge them, but they can also be used as a battery source when they're fully charged and connected to your home. And then you have battery storage systems, and as was mentioned, Hydro Quebec uh, is uh, developing uh, battery storage systems for the distribution grid. And they're trying to make a business case out of it, so this is one of the applications. 
Now you can extend the whole concept of uh, microgrids to other types of grids. So it, at the lowest level, you look at a nanogrid. The nanogrid is just a home. The storage can be a storage element to handle solar energy, the variability of solar energy, but you can also look upon it as being your electric vehicle that's in the garage. And then if you go a bit uh, bigger, you look at the microgrid, and it also has storage in a number of places, in particular to handle PV variability. And then you can combine nanogrids, microgrids into mini-grids, and mini-grids are then tied to the main grid, the uh, transmission grid. So that's a picture of what people see as coming. And the only thing is that to be able to handle all of this, you need a lot of electronics and a lot of control. <clears throat> Another very promising application, particularly in Canada and in remote places, is uh, the isolated, the remote community grids. I, I put this picture there to show that storage is not only battery storage. People are pushing, some people are pushing hydrogen storage, fuel cells. It's an option. The only problem is that we still have to see a commercially viable fuel cell. But this is an example of what was tried in uh, Newfoundland. Uh, they had a diesel generator, they had a wind turbine, they added another wind turbine to have more renewable. The only problem is that you can end up with excess wind energy when the wind blows or at night or in places like that. So essentially you convert that into hydrogen, you store it in a tank, and then you either burn it in a diesel generator, which is feasible, or a fuel cell, and you produce energy on demand. So this system becomes essentially dispatchable energy. So those are the applications of microgrids. Now, what are the business cases? Because behind all of this, there's a question of money. There's a question of investment. You're not going to pay something very expensive if you have the grid, your grid tied, and the grid provides you electricity at five or seven cents a kilowatt hour, and here, essentially, you're producing at 40, 50 cents. There's no business case there. The question is then, where's the business case? Well, there's definitely a business case in remote communities in Quebec and in Canada. And it's essentially displacing or replacing diesel-based electricity generation, which is very expensive. Typic typically, you're looking at 40, 50 cents a kilowatt hour, so there's a business case there. Assuming that remote communities can operate the complexity of a microgrid. And then there's other installations and there's a lot of them in the U.S. that require high reliability and resiliency. <coughs> resiliency is a very big issue since Sandy destroyed a lot of uh, the New York and New York area electric power grids. And there was a blackout that lasted a long time. So resiliency is a big issue. So you have military bases that could benefit, government compound sensitive manufacturing installation, data centers, all systems that require premium power. Other development, potential developments, and the current demonstration projects in many of these areas, net zero communities, energy independence, Fast EV charging stations along highways would require storage if you wanted to make them efficient. Electrified transportation and self-contained entities like we're talking a lot in the States about university campuses that are microgrids, government labs, and so on. So, of course, uh, technology is evolving, and there are certain things that you want to happen to make them cost-effective. Everything has to do with reducing the cost. So what are the elements that can reduce the cost of an installation? First of all, there's a battery cost, and there's a lot of effort going into that. And then there's a the whole issue of dev development and standardization of energy management systems. One of the arguments for putting together microgrids is that storage is embedded, but the requirement then is that you need an energy management system to manage all the generation, the storage, and the loads. 
Then you have to develop, and there's a lot of work going on in that area, to affordable and suitable sensors, information and communication technologies. And then there's the whole issue of standardization of microgrid controllers and energy management systems. Other requirements include the evolution of the regulatory context, and people mentioned that, that you have to redefine the role and relationship of the microgrid to the distribution system. In other words, the relationship between the distribution system operator and the local autonomous microgrids. And you also have to allow the microgrid to enter the energy market to play with the distribution system so that you essentially can sell services, either sell energy or sell services. And uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much.